Okay, so in today's video, we're going to be looking here at chapter 12, which is the last chapter in our accounting 2301 course or our financial accounting course. So we'll pick up in accounting 2302 with chapter 14, um, but this will be the last one for the first class. So congratulations, you have almost survived. So we'll go ahead and get started. So in here in chapter 12, the primary thing that we are looking at is the statement of cash flows. And we'll spend a lot of time in this chapter really digging into exactly what it is, how it works, what the purpose of it actually is, who uses it, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but before we begin, here's just a couple of things that it will actually do for us. It's going to help us identify how a company actually receives its cash. So where are the cash inflows coming from? It's going to help us explain the change in the overall cash balance. We'll see it does that down at the bottom. Um, we'll see and kind of explore this question. Well, why do income and cash flows differ, right? Are they not the same thing? And of course, we know that those are different. Um, and we'll kind of explore that topic a lot in this chapter. And then, of course, where a company spends its cash. So all very important questions for a company to consider. And so with those things in mind, we are going to begin. So as we just said, um, the importance of cash flows can be identified by answering the question on the previous page, as well as helping us to determine if we actually have enough money to pay our debts. Because as you know, income doesn't necessarily mean a company can pay its debts. Um, in the textbook, even it gives examples of companies who have actually had significant sums of net income over several years, but they still went bankrupt because they didn't generate enough cash flow. So they weren't able to pay employees, they weren't able to pay rent, they weren't able to make payments on their notes and pay their interest. And eventually this lack of cash actually led to the bankruptcy of the company, even though they had sufficient net income. So income is not always going to tie um, exactly into cash flow. And that's something very important to realize. Next, this will, of course, help users evaluate the company's ability to pursue any unexpected opportunities. So if I've got a significant sum of cash sitting there, then maybe I can invest in that opportunity that we didn't expect. But if I'm really, really low on cash, I'm not going to be able to do that. And this will, of course, also help us planning in our day to day operations, and it will help us see if we can um, if we have the cash available right now to invest in our long term assets or our long term structure of the company. So a lot of really important things here in this last chapter um, with the statement of cash flows. Now, one thing that we've got to realize is that we're going to be looking at what are called cash and cash equivalents. Cash equivalents are a little bit more vague than cash. I think we all kind of understand what cash is. But cash equivalents are where we can get kind of kind of caught up sometimes. So these are short term, highly liquid investments. Typically, these have an original maturity of 90 days or less um, that can bounce around a little bit. Um, it's kind of going through the process um, with FASB and everything. But that seems to be kind of where we're at at the at the time of this recording is 90 days or less original maturity is going to be considered a cash equivalent. These are readily convertible to cash. And they're sufficiently close to maturity so that the market value is unaffected by interest rate changes. This is that 90 day maturity or less. Um, so do kind of have that that number in mind. So if I borrow or if I take out, say, a, a 60 day bond from the Treasury, well, that would be sufficiently close to maturity at issuance that it would it would qualify here. This isn't the remaining maturity. either. This is the original maturity that we're talking about. So be very careful with that. Um, the next thing we want to look at is being able to distinguish between three different types of activities. So the first type of activity that we're looking at is going to be operating, followed by investing, and then, of course, financing. And then our fourth activity, which isn't really one of the main activities on the statement, is what's called non-cash investing and financing activities. And so we'll deal with these four areas as we progress through this chapter. So for the next thing that we want to look at of course, our three main groupings. And I'll tell you the easiest way to remember these, and this is the order that you will need to know them in also, right? It's not just knowing that these are the three groups. You specifically need to know the order. So the way that I would recommend that you remember this is that, oops, I forgot. And this is a mnemonic that I saw um, somewhere. I don't remember exactly where I learned it to begin with. Uh, but I did not come up with this. This is certainly something that I, I'm borrowing from somewhere. Um, but this is a really good mnemonic that I found that helps us remember. So OOPS being the, of course, O for operating, the I very clearly dealing with the I in investing, 
then the F, of course, for financing. So if you can remember this mnemonic, it will help you as you start to go through this chapter with the order that we'll actually be dealing with this. So the very first of those groupings then is the operating activities. And so you can see we've got some inflow and some outflow type items. So inflows, um, the, the general idea within, uh, sorry, with operating, I uh, accidentally switched slides without, without noticing. Um, and then I, I caught it as I started to talk about it. Um, because they've got such similar graphics, it almost got me. So we've got operating activities. And the general rule here is these are the things that are the day-to-day -day operations. So if you kind of want to think of it like that, we can say these are the day-to-day -day operations of the company. Um, you could also think of this as the items that will typically impact income on the income statement. right? Or you could even say these are most commonly the current assets and current liabilities on the balance sheet. So a lot of stuff falls under operating. And so we can see here just some examples that the book gives us. Um, cash from cash sales to customers, receipt of dividend and interest revenue, and then collections of cash from credit sales. Of course, all those cash coming in, cash going out, paying operating expenses, wages of our employees, rent, those types of things. And we see that of course here more specifically, um, the wages and salaries. Um, next, we see anything to pay taxes or fines. Paying interest is also under operating. So you'll notice the receipt of interest is under operating. So is the payment of interest. And then, of course, we're paying any suppliers for goods or services. That would also be falling under this category. So very good. Now, the next group that we see is our investing activities. General rule for investing activities. Um, these tend to be what we call our long-term assets, our long-term assets. But there is also one exception in that we also include here our short-term investments. So short-term investments are also an investing activity, even though on the last slide we said current assets and current liabilities are typically operating. The one exception here is if you see the word investment, it is an investing activity. So do keep that in mind. So typically we're looking at lot, things like long-term assets. So the purchase, and sale of our long-term assets. So this could be, we bought a building for cash, we bought a vehicle for cash, we sold a vehicle, we sold a building, anything like that. And of course we see all of those types of items down here. So inflows from selling an intangible asset. So maybe we sold a patent from selling a building, from collecting the principal. Now notice this, right? This is a very important point here, collecting the principal on notes receivable not the interest, right? You'll notice not the interest because the interest would have been an operating activity. Whereas the principal portion, that's an investing activity. So you got to be kind of careful um, from selling or discounting notes receivable. Of course, that would be another one. Um, outflows, well, we loaned money in return for notes receivable. So we gave up the money at this point in time. We purchased something like a patent or a copyright. We bought a new building. We bought short-term investments. We bought long-term investments. You'll notice normally here, we're either buying or giving money away. And that's an outflow, of course. On the other hand, whenever I'm selling something or I'm collecting, that tends to be the giveaway that we're talking about an inflow. So be very careful there. Make sure you understand the wording. Now, the last area of the, of the main topics um, on the statement of cash flows is our financing activities. And so if we kind of go through it, we'll see that what we figured out is that so far, our current assets and current liabilities, as well as our income statement stuff, tends to fall into operating. Our long-term assets tend to be investing, and that really only leaves us with a couple of things to be financing. So typically in our financing section, this will be our long-term liabilities and our equity. Long-term liabilities and equity tend to be our financing activities, and that's exactly what we see here. So as we go through these examples that the book's given us, this is the, of course, cash inflow from the issuance of common stock and preferred stock, from reissuing treasury stock, from issuing short and long-term debt. Of course, this could be a notes payable or bonds payable. And then, of course, any money that the owners have contributed for stock or for just contributions. Um, and then, of course, outflows. You'll notice dividends to shareholders are a financing activity. The purchase of treasury stock is a financing activity. Any money withdrawn by the owners is a financing activity. And any payment 
to pay off its short and long-term debt for notes or bonds payable will also, of course, be a financing activity. And so what we see primarily here is that these are dealing with typically our long-term liabilities and our equity, which is very nice. So one thing I would like to point out at this point is you'll notice as we went through each of these, we saw on both sides the purchase on one side, the sale on the other typically. And so what we notice, a key rule here is that once an activity has been classified, so once an activity has been classified, it remains in that classification. And you say, well, okay, that doesn't really help that much. So for example, the purchase of a building is investing as, or in addition to, as well as the sale of the building is investing. And so the purchase of the building is investing. That's pretty clear, I think. But where we get confused a lot of times is we'll want to say then whenever we sell the building, that's financing. Because we're saying, oh, well, we sold the building to generate cash to do something else to finance this expansion. But in this context, Right. If when you purchase the building, it was investing. When you sell the building, it is investing. If whenever you sold the stock, it was financing. Whenever you paid the dividend, it is financing. Right. And so you've got to realize that once you've pegged this activity, whatever it is within one of these three categories, it's not bouncing between them. It's staying in that category. Very, very important concept to understand here. Now, for the next piece, we said, well, we've got this other type of item, non-cash investing and financing. So these are things that affect, that affect, I'm sorry, multiple areas of our statement of cash flows, but don't actually impact cash at all. So for example, we have retired debt by issuing equity stock. So this is a debt conversion into equity, right? Well, in that case, the debt's going away and the equity's going up, but there's no cash transfer here. Conversion of preferred stock to common stock. Once again, no cash transfer here. Lease of assets in a capital lease transaction. Once again, no cash transfer here. Purchase of long-term assets issuing a note or a bond. Once again, no cash transfer. So you'll notice in each of these cases, something is happening, sure, but it's not directly affecting cash. So what we've got to figure out is, well, how do we handle these? And the way we handle these transactions is they, of course, won't go in one of the three categories up top, but we'll either have a section down at the bottom called significant non-cash investing and financing activities, where we'll disclose this for our investors, or we'll actually come in and leave a note to the financial statements in the overall notes, indicating what has happened to these non-cash investing and financing activities. And we'll see some examples of that in class. Now, the general format for the statement of cash flows will look something like this. This is where we will start with the cash flows from operating activities. We'll look at investing and financing. And then, of course, we'll deal with all of the stuff down at the bottom where we're showing out the actual increase or decrease in cash and that total balance at the end. Now, this is actually a bit abbreviated. It's not quite completely correct. We'll see a more full example in just a little while. But this is the general flow, right? Toward the top, we'll have operating activities. After that, we'll have our investing activities finishing out with financing activities. And then if we had any significant non-cash transactions, we could indicate that at the bottom. But that is how that would work. Now, for the next piece, we're looking at the actual preparation, what this really looks like. So the first thing is to compute the net increase or decrease in cash, which is a large part of this. We'll then compute net cash from operating. We'll compute net cash from investing and financing. And then, of course, we will compute net cash from all sources and then prove it out by adding that to beginning cash, and that should equal ending cash, which should tie back to the cash balance on the balance sheet. So in this case, we're analyzing the cash account. So cash account is a natural place to look for information about cash flows, of course. And so what we would do is we'd have to come down in here and we would look around and we would try to figure out, well, what is happening in each of these cases? And right, so what is happening? So in this case, we could certainly tell, well, we had a payment for inventory. Well, inventory is a current asset. That's going to be an operating activity. And we could repeat this process the whole way down, right, and try to figure out what each one of these things was affecting. And so we can certainly do that, right? We would say, oh, we received cash from customers. That's an operating activity. We sold an asset, right? So assuming it's a long-term asset, then we would say, well, that is an investing activity. And we could certainly go through and classify all of these, but that's how we would handle this.
Now, if it's a non-cash account, it becomes a little bit trickier, right? We got to be a little bit more careful because whenever we have a non-cash account, we have to really think through what transaction would have transpired to lead to the change that we're seeing, right? So to do that, we're going to need some information. The first thing that we're going to need are what are called comparative balance sheets. So what this is, is I'll see, for example, I'll have a balance sheet, then I'll have the current year. So we'll just do current year in one column and I will have all of the information here. And I might have prior year in this column and then I'll have all of the prior year numbers here. What I'll be looking to do is to compare for each account, the change from the current year, or rather from the prior year to the current year, right? If the account went up, what does that indicate about cash? If the account went down, what does that indicate about cash? We'll figure out that it really matters what type of account we're looking at, right? Are we looking at an asset? Are we looking at a liability? Are we looking at an equity account? All those things are going to matter to us as we go through this process. So comparative balance sheets will be the first thing that we need. Once we do that, we'll need our current income statement. So we will look at that. And then of course, any additional information. So this may be explaining the things that have happened on the comparative balance sheets. It may be explaining something on the income statement, or it may just be describing those non-cash activities that we talked about earlier, those significant non-cash investing and financing activities, right? Anything like that could be comprised within this additional information. But we really don't know, but we need as much information as we can get, right? And the more information we have, the more able we will be to actually prepare this correctly. So that's the idea, right? So this is the type of information that we will need. Now, in truth, there are two primary ways to prepare the statement of cash flows. The first that we're going to talk about is the indirect method. The second is the direct method. I will tell you in this class, the one that I am most concerned that you understand. So let me get this right. So the one that I am most concerned that you understand is the indirect method, right? If you understand only one of these, make sure it's this one, because this is the one that we are going to focus on in this class. If you're an accounting major, right, you will need to be familiar with the direct methods also. If you understand both, of course, that's better. The direct method is primarily covered in, append in the appendix to this chapter, while the indirect method is covered in the main chapter. So that is why we will be focusing on indirect. But of course, if you would like to go over the direct method, come by my office, send me an email. I'll be happy to walk you through it. It's just not going to be covered in this video because what we are primarily concerned about is the indirect method. So I will point out the major switch though in the two is that under the indirect method, we begin with net income. Under the direct method, we do not. You'll notice under the direct method, we actually don't deal with net income at all, right? We are dealing with a totally different set of information. But you'll notice at the end of the day, we're coming out to the same amount of cash provided by operating activities, okay? It's not changing the total, it's just changing the format. Now, one other really important thing to note here is that the choice between using the indirect and the direct method will only, right, will only impact the operating section. Right, the other sections, the investing section, the financing section, the non-cash transaction section, no, nothing else about this will be changed, just the operating section and just the format. As you notice here, the actual totals for net cash provided by operating are the same, right, are the same. So do make sure you are aware of that, okay? Now, the next thing that we wanna look at is how we would actually go about this. So it may help you as we go through this to take a picture of this slide um, or have it handy in some way so that as you watch this video, you can see where these things are coming from. Uh, without this handy, it could be a little bit confusing to you as to exactly why some of the numbers are where they are, how this is working, et cetera. So it may be helpful if you just take out your phone, snap a quick picture, take a snippet on your computer, do something so that you have this available. So as we continue down, what we will notice is that here we start with the statement of cash flows, calculating the operating section. Notice, once again, the primary focus in this chapter is on the indirect method. So if we go back to our previous slide, we'll notice that my net income was given to me, in this case of $38,000. So we simply pull that 38,000 through to the top line here. 
And so that is where this $38,000 has come from, is just from the income statement on the previous slide. And if you're wondering, well, how do I know if I'm always going to have my income statement available? Well, you remember from the beginning of the semester, we talked about the order in which we prepare our financial statements. And we said that the very first one that we should prepare is the income statement, followed by the statement of retained earnings, followed by the balance sheet, followed by the statement of cash flows. So by the time we're actually preparing the statement of cash flows, you can see I should already have any information I could possibly need because all of my other financial statements at this point in time are done. All right, so that's how we know that we can count on having that information available because it should already be done. Now, the next thing that we wanna look at is what's happening here. So the very first thing that we adjust for typically is depreciation expense. So depreciation expense tends to be our one non-cash expense. So non-cash expenses must be added back on the statement of cash flows. And that's because all I'm looking for on the statement of cash flows is how much cash I've got. So if cash doesn't get impacted by non-cash expense like depreciation, and at lower net income, my starting point is net income, then to correct that, as far as the cash analysis, what I have to do is I have to add back that piece, that $24,000. So that's what we're seeing happen here. So we're gonna start at the 38, and that's net income, prepared on the accrual basis of accounting. And now I'm having to go over back and say, well, okay, that's accrual, I need to get back to cash. So under cash basis, it's only an expense if I actually paid cash for it and didn't pay cash for depreciation. And so I have to add that back. So that is why we must add back this $24,000. Now, the next two, you got to be a little bit careful on because these two tend to trip people up quite a bit because it's almost counterintuitive at first. But once you see it, it makes sense why we treat these the way that we do. So you'll notice the loss on the sale of plan assets is actually being added back. So the idea here is a loss on the income statement reduced income, but I didn't pay cash because of the loss. So it reduced income, but it didn't require cash outflow. So we add back the loss. Conversely, the gain, well, a gain would have increased income on the income statement, but I didn't necessarily receive cash because of the gain. So it increased net income, but it didn't result in an increase in cash. So we have to take it out at this point. So that is what is happening in this section here. Now, the next piece is looking at my changes in current assets and liabilities. And so we're going to walk through these fairly slowly to make sure that we understand them. So the very first one here is an increase in accounts receivable. And what I would do if I were you and I'm first learning about the statement of cash flows, I would indicate to myself, this is a current asset. And the current asset has gone up. So if the current asset has gone up, then cash has gone down, right? Then cash goes down. And the reason for that is that if the accounts receivable goes up, the reason it went up is I've not received the cash. So if you want to think about it in terms of the journal entry, what happened here is we came in, we had an increase to accounts receivable. So this is something like this, a debit to, in, to accounts receivable, a credit to sales revenue. But you'll notice that there's no cash being received in this instance. And because of that, cash is actually going down. So if we look back at the previous year, so let's pop back over to our information, we can see that in the prior year, in the prior year, let's bump over just a hair, my accounts receivable had a balance of 40,000 and now it is 60,000. So I've got an additional $20,000 that has not yet been collected. And that is the reason for this decrease to cash here. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear all this because it's starting to get kind of messy and we'll just start back. So that explains why when the current asset increased, the cash came down. Now you'll notice the exact same thing happening to inventory and that's because inventory is also a current asset. So it will behave the same way. Now the next piece here is the increase in prepaid expenses. So the question is, well, why is an increase in prepaid expenses resulting in a decrease? It's also a current asset, but this one might be a little tougher to visualize 
But this one's a little bit more direct, actually. So how do we increase a prepaid expense? Well, I debit the prepaid expense and I credit cash. So if the overall prepaid expense balance is higher, that's because I paid more out in advance this year with cash. So that increased cash outflow results in a negative in this case. Now, on the other hand, we see a decrease in accounts payable. That's also being subtracted for much the same reason. How do I decrease accounts payable? Well, I'm going to debit accounts payable, which will bring it down, and I'm going to credit cash. And so when I see that underlying entry, I can very clearly see that the result is actually going to be that decrease to the cash account as we see here. Same exact thing happening with interest payable is also a liability account. And then of course, the other hand, I've got a debit, I've got an increase, I'm sorry, to income taxes payable. And the reason that that is behaving in the way that it is, is the entry for this would be a debit to income taxes expense. Yeah. And a credit to income taxes payable. And so you'll notice there's no cash leaving at this point. So if the payable has gone up, the reason the payable has gone up is because I've not yet paid the cash. And if I haven't paid the cash, then that means I still have the cash. But the expense brought down income, right? And our starting point, remember, is income. So if we brought down income, but we didn't actually pay cash, we've got to add the cash back. And that's what's happening here. And so you can see whenever you come down 38 plus 24 plus 6 minus 16, et cetera, whenever you do all of that, you'll come down to a positive $20,000. Now, a quick note here about this ending number. I don't care too much what it is numerically, like what the actual value is. But I would like to see, right, typically we should see positive cash flows from operations, right? In the event we have negative cash flows from operations, this is typically seen as a sign of financial distress. And the reason that is, and if you just think about it, it makes sense. Operations are the things that my company does day in and day out every day. If I'm not generating positive cash flow on what I'm actually doing, then that's not a good sign, right? Now we'll notice in some of the other sections, I might be okay with a negative. I might even expect a negative, but in the operations section, I should come out with a positive number or it is a dire warning sign in most cases to my company that we've really got to start figuring some stuff out. Because if this is negative, it means eventually I may not be able to pay all my bills, right? I'm not going to have sufficient cash is what this is a warning sign of. We have to be very careful. Typically, we should find that the operations section for a healthy company is positive, is positive. Very good. Now, you'll notice here, uh, for anything not affecting cash, so expenses and losses with no cash outflows added back to net income. So for example, that's the depreciation expense. Revenues and gains with no inflows are of course subtracted. And that's how we handle that gain that we saw a second ago. So that's explaining this section. Now this table is really handy um, if you like it. So you might want to commit this to memory, write it down, take a picture of it, whatever it is. Uh, but this just tells us that if we're dealing with a current asset and the account balance increased, and then we subtract that from income, and that's what we saw, right? Whenever inventory went up, that resulted in a subtraction. And if the current asset has gone down, then we increase income. So for example, if my income balance goes down, the reason that happened is because I made a sale. And if we assume a cash sale, then that brings up income. If I don't assume a cash sale, and I say it's on credit, well, then that will get netted out later in that same section because we'll notice the change in accounts receivable and that will take care of that. So it will work, right? It's just maybe more than one step. Now for the next piece, our current liabilities. If the current liability has increased, right, that's accounts payable, for example, the reason it increased is because we've not paid it. And if I haven't paid it, I have cash. So that's boosting the cash account. And of course, the opposite is true if the current liability has gone down. So if I've reduced the liability, if the payable has gone down, the reason it's gone down is because I paid it. And so this is a really good pictorial description of what is happening in just the generalized cases. So very good. Next, we have adjustments for changes in current assets and liabilities. So just more explanation of kind of what we've talked through up until this point. I'll leave it here for just a second if you wanna look at it. 
but this is just the book going through all the same explanations that we just went through. So in this case, we've got just a general form. So I'm not going to tell you to memorize this per se, but this is definitely a good picture to be familiar with, right? This is definitely something that as you're coming into the fourth exam, especially if I've told you this semester, hey, I'm going to have you prepare a statement of cash flows. This is a really good table to understand or a really good chart to understand because it really goes through in quite a bit of detail how that operations section is to be prepared. Now, this is not the whole statement, don't get me wrong, but this is probably the most detailed section in the book that gives you a really good summary of what's all happening in that operations section. And I will tell you the operations section is by far, by far the most involved of the sections on the statement of cash flows. The other two sections, um, much, much easier. So this was the operations section. Now, the next thing that we want to look at is our investing and financing sections. So the textbook uses what's called a three-step process to determine the cash provided or used by investing and financing. So we first identify changes in the accounts related to investing or financing. We explain those changes using T accounts and reconstruction entries, and then we report the cash flow effects. So here we go. So in this case, we are looking at our first investment related account, plant assets, just something like building. And it says, this analysis reveals a $40,000 increase. So from 210 to 250 in plant assets and a $12,000 increase in accumulated depreciation. You can see that from 48 to 60, right? So that's the first step, that's the analysis. Now, the question is, well, how do we get that to happen? Well, what this tells us is Genesis purchased plant assets of 60,000 by issuing 60,000 in notes payable. So this would have been the original entry, a debit to plant assets, a credit to notes payable. Then they tell us in the textbook, item C reports Genesis sold plant assets costing 20,000, 12,000 in accumulated depreciation for 2,000 in cash. So right away, we go ahead, we've dealt with this type of entry before in chapter eight, debit to cash for the amount we got, debit to accumulated depreciation to get rid of it for 12, credit to plant assets for 20. So we see that in that case, I've got 14,000 in debits, 20,000 in credits. The plug here, of course, is the $6,000 loss, right? The $6,000 loss. So this would have been the entry that would have occurred for that piece to happen. And then, of course, we reconstruct the entry for depreciation expense using the information that they gave us. And so we have a debit to depreciation expense, a credit to accumulated depreciation. And you'll notice that all of this reconciles, right? So I look back at this, I can see that my plant assets increased by 40. Well, here's an increase of 60, decrease of 20, there's the 40. I can see that my depreciation, my accumulated depreciation increased by 12. And you say, well, here's the 24. And then we took off the 12. So there's the $12,000 increase. So all of this does hit all the knots. It does hit all the notches. Uh, we've done exactly what we needed to do. We've now seen the process that would have happened in this case. So now we're ready for the third step to actually look at the cash effects. So in this case, it tells us we reconstructed the T accounts to show the changes. So they've done all of that, bringing everything up to date. And then the identified cash flows are reported in the investing section. So the cash received from the sale of the plant asset was only 2,000. So that would be in the investing section. And then the purchased plant assets with the issuance of the notes, that would be in the non-cash investing and financing activity section, right, for $60,000. And so I will tell you, as a student, um, whenever we got to this section, for me, I never really committed that as well to memory as I should have. Um, as a student, I kept looking, right? I knew what operating was. I knew what investing was. I knew what financing was. And then I got to a question on, I think on one of the exams and they gave me like that exact example, right? We purchased a building and with the issuance of a note or with the issuance of some, some stock, right? Whatever it was. And I looked at that and I said, well, it's an investing activity and it's a financing activity. And, and my mind kind of broke. I didn't know where to go with that because I was like, how can it be multiple things it's got to be one of them. And kind of the trick that I want you to understand is that if you're under multiple of these sections, particularly with investing and financing, then I'm going to tell you like almost certainly, I'm, I'm almost 100% confident on this, that that is going to be a non-cash investing and financing activity, right? 
I mean, barring some just bizarre example that I can't come up with off the top of my head, I can't come up with a way that that could be anything else, right? If you bought an asset and you took out a note for the full balance, then it's going to be a non-cash investing and financing activity because you have the asset increase, right? So you bought the building that's investing. And then the way that you funded it was with either a note or a stock issuance. And in either case, that is a liability. So that big liability is going up. So you've got a non-cash item. And so that would be reported in this extra section down here. So be very careful, right? I will tell you that that question, it got me as a student and it gets students every semester, right? Don't let it get you, right? Whenever you see that happen, whenever you see this type of situation occur, then that should trigger to you the idea that this is a non-cash activity, right? If you don't see cash, it's non-cash, right? Don't make it more complicated than it needs to be. Very good. Next, we're looking at financing. You'll notice a very similar uh, type three-step procedure that we've got here. So first thing that we're looking at here is our long-term notes payable. And we can see that is a $26,000 increase. So now it tells us um, notes with a carrying value of 34,000 are retired for 18 in cash resulting in a $16,000 gain. So this was just given information in the text. So whenever you go through the book, you follow through this example, you'll find all this given information. And so whenever we deal with this, we take out the notes payable of 34, bringing it down with a debit for nothing credit the cash for the amount paid, and then we deal with the gain on the retirement of the debt for 16,000. Now, the next part reports the cash paid for the notes retirement and the financing activities. So the cash paid to retire the note, $18,000, that will come out there. And then of course, we have another situation where we're looking at common stock. So step one in analyzing the stock reviews, uh, comparative balance sheets, so we show in this case an increase in common stock from 80 to 95,000. Step two tells us um, that we should, goodness gracious, the change of item D, which reports 3,000 uh, shares of common stock are issued at $5 per share par. So that's the $15,000 increase here. And then step three reports cash received in the financing section. So of course we come down and we show that cash received in the financing section. And we'll work through quite a few examples of things like this in class. And we'll even do a couple of full blown um, statements of cash flows. And we'll even see quite a bit of this on your homework, right? So, so it's not like every example in here has to be completely flushed out, right? I'm not trying to, to monopolize your evening as you watch this. I'm, I'm trying to keep it as concise as you can. So if you do have a question, uh, please send me an email. Please come by my office. Let me know. I'm happy to talk with you about it. Um, but I, I try to keep these videos as short as I possibly can. So in the next section, what we're looking at here is cash flows from financing related to retained earnings transactions. So step one, we analyze retained earnings and we notice that our retained earnings increased from 88 to 112. Step two explains that we had a cash dividend of 14,000. And so then we've got to deal with the dividend payment. So that dividend, of course, is a financing activity. Remember, the initial issuance of the stock was financing. So that refund of the initial investment in the form of a dividend is also financing. All right, remember that rule from earlier. Once the activity has been classified, it stays within the classification. It doesn't start bouncing around. It stays within whatever it is. So very good. So that's how we handle that piece. Now, the proving of the cash balances, this happens at the very end. So we come down. 20,000 plus 2,000 is 22, minus 17 is $5,000. That's my net increase in cash. I was told in the text that my cash balance at the previous year end was $12,000, and that will give me 17,000 for my cash balance at year end. This should then be compared back to the balance for cash on my balance sheet, and it should match. It should match. So here's a T account setup of all of the things that we just did. Um, so I'm not going to walk through this, but you certainly, if you were at all confused, go back through, maybe print out this slide separately and then kind of work through it as you look. And you can certainly see how it all ties together. Uh, but very good kind of summary here. Now, next, what we want to look at is cash sources and uses. And actually, before we do that, I'm sorry, I do want to go back real quick. And I do want to point out something that, that we do expect. So we mentioned earlier that this number right here, the net cash provided by operating activities, this we would expect to be positive, right? I do want that to be positive. If it is not positive, it is or it does tend to be a sign 
uh, that the company is experiencing some financial difficulty. So we do like to see that the cash provided by operating activities is positive. Absolutely, that should be the case in a healthy company in you know, the vast majority of cases. Now, if it's temporarily negative, right? So like, for example, you've got a lot of sales on credit right at the end of the year that you're gonna collect, you know, middle of the first month of the next year, it may not be that big of a deal. Um, but certainly if it's consistently negative for a long period of time, very, very concerning. Now, the next section that we look at is the investing. So for the investing section, this company, I'm actually not that thrilled with. What I would like to see in most cases is actually a negative in the investing section, because what that tells me is that you're investing in your company, right? You're buying new buildings, you're buying new equipment, you're doing things with those investments to help the long-term health of the company. So the fact that this is positive, I'm not actually that happy about, right? Because it means that there's a good chance you could have done more investment, right? Maybe you're fine. Maybe you got everything you need. Um, so this is positive, but typically we do like to see positive for operating, negative for investing, so that we know we are actually investing in our company going forward. And then, of course, the last piece that we've got here, the last piece is the portion oops, related to the financing activities. And this doesn't really have a hard rule as to if it should be positive or negative. So I'll just put plus or minus, right? It could be positive. It could be negative. It really just depends on how we set up the company that period, right? If I paid for stuff in cash on um, those long-term assets, then I won't actually be receiving that cash, right? I'll be paying. So this could, it could turn around a little bit. If I took out a lot of loans, if I issued a lot of stock to pay for stuff, then this could be positive more easily. But it certainly could be one or the other, right? It doesn't really have a hard and fast rule, but typically what we like to see positive for um, operations, negative um, for the financing, and then positive or negative for financing, okay? So positive for operations, negative for investing, positive or negative for financing. And it does look like these got off just a hair as I scrolled down. Um, so for example, this should be there. And that should be there. Okay, very good. So with that, we'll go ahead and continue down. So in this question, they tell us managers are going to be reviewing cash flow for business decisions, and creditors, of course, will evaluate a company's ability to generate enough cash to repay the debts, and investors will assess cash flows before buying and selling stock, right? People look at this statement of cash flows, and they put a lot of emphasis on it, right? Because if the company doesn't have enough cash, the rest of the financial statements don't really matter. Right. If you can't pay your bills, if you can't pay your employees, nothing else matters because the company cannot survive. So I'm not going to say it's the most important, but it is certainly a very important financial statement. So in this case, we look. Notice BMX and ATV both have positive cash flows from operations. So I'm thinking those two are good. I'm a little bit worried about Trex, though because Trex actually has a loss or a negative, right? As far as their cash provided um, from operations, which means they're actually using more cash than they're generating from operations, which is a problem, right? It's not a healthy sign. So we're a little bit worried here. These two, once again, we see that negative um, for investing. So that tells me they are investing wisely, right? They're hopefully wisely, at least. They are investing in long-term assets. They are building up their infrastructure. That's a good thing. Here, this company not only had a loss from operations, they're also selling their long-term assets. Once again, not a good sign for this company or for this division. And then of course, the next section, uh, proceeds from the issuance of debt. So they're taking on some more debt to try to deal with all of this. Um, not necessarily bad in itself, but given the other information I'm seeing, I'm not thinking that debt's coming from a good place, right? I'm thinking that debt is a last ditch effort to survive. So in this case, I'm going to say that debt's probably not a sign um, of confidence in the company, right? It's, it's them leveraging, trying to survive. And on the other hand, this company is actually repaying a lot of their debt, right? And so what we find is that this company is actually improving um, their ratios by getting rid of the debt, which could be good. But you'll notice at the end of the day, they all resulted 
in the same $15,000 increase. But by the way that this works out, we can tell very clearly some very important things about the health of these companies, right? About the health of these companies. So very important analysis, right? Overall, the number at the bottom is the same, but that's not what's important. What's important is the distinction, right? How did we get down to this number? What is the story that this section told me, right? It's not just the end number. It's not like we can just look at net income and go, oh yeah, we have positive net income, right? Just a net increase or decrease in cash is not enough information for me to tell if that company's healthy or not. I need to understand these breakdowns, right? How much of this came from operations? How much of this came from financing? How much of this came from investing, right? All those things have to be answered. And if I can't answer those, I do not have enough information to know about the health of my company's cash account. Very good, very good. Now, the next thing we wanna look at is the cash flow on total assets. So this case, pretty much exactly what it sounds like. We're just going to take our operating cash flows, which we saw computed just a second ago even. Um, all right, so it'd be just this section here. So the operating cash flows divided by my average total assets, and that is it. Um, now, the rest of this chapter deals with spreadsheet preparation, which certainly, I mean, if you're going into this at all, if you're going to be an accounting major, if you think you want to get into accounting, um, certainly not a bad section to look at in the appendix. I would firmly believe that the more proficient you are in Excel, the better accountant you will be. Um, whether you go to a company that uses Excel exclusively or they have their own proprietary spreadsheet software or some other program, the better you are with spreadsheets in general, the better you will be at picking up a new, a new software. And I mean, from my time in public accounting, I can tell you 90% of the day, a lot of times it's been in Excel. So get good at it, figure out how it works, figure out how to get formatting down and your life will be that much easier when you get out of here. So not something that I'm gonna test, uh, but certainly something that's not a bad idea to review, particularly if you're going into accounting, even if you're going into finance. Uh, finance uses a lot of spreadsheets, a lot of detail oriented stuff like this. So be very careful as you go through that appendix. If you wanna look at it with me, I'm once again, happy to do so. And then of course the second appendix or appendix B goes through the direct method. I will not be testing you on the direct method unless I specifically go over it in class and specifically make that announcement in class. But as of the time of this recording, it is not my intention to cover the direct method. That could certainly change um, if we ever adopt a new book and it becomes part of the main chapter, if something like that occurs. Uh, but if there is a change to the coverage, I will be sure to mention it in class. So with that, we have officially wrapped up the end of our last lecture. So if you have any questions, once again, please never hesitate to reach out to me, send me an email, uh, drop by my office. I'm always happy to see y'all. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the class. I wish you all nothing but success as you move out of this class and into your future classes and into your careers. Um, so I look forward to talking to you all then. We'll see you all next time. Thank you.